welcome everybody. Um, particularly uh, if you uh, don't know the Primrose Hill Community Association, uh, special welcome to you. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Tim Kirkpatrick. Um, I'm chair of the uh, events committee here at uh, in the in Primrose Hill at the community centre. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say that uh, due to the, the COVID, we've uh, had to cancel our uh, fashion show and our village disco, um, which are the uh, the things that uh, I really enjoy. But anyway, uh, this has uh, it's got us working uh, on a new uh, series of talks, uh, interviews, presentations um, that we are uh, possibly rather portentously calling the view from the hill. Uh, anyway, this is the uh, this is the inaugural event. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, you can say that you were here. Um, also, thanks very much uh, to our uh, participants this evening. Uh, Nick Jackson, uh, author of The Finance Curse, and uh, Stephen Robinson, who's a journalist, lives in Primrose Hill. Uh, Nick's actually in Berlin at the moment. Um, uh, Nick's an old friend of mine, uh, so he might have felt duty bound to, uh, to participate, uh, but Stephen, I don't know uh, at all. He was recommended to us by a, a journalist friend, so particular special thanks to him. Uh, also thanks to, to Doro, to Peter and to Jason who help, uh, help run uh, these evenings. Um, so we are using AirMeet uh, as a platform. Uh, we hope that's a nice break for you from Zoom if you've been Zoomed out. Um, there is in the chat, uh, there is a YouTube link that you can see. So if you're having any trouble on AirMeet, um, just go over to YouTube and we'll be streaming it there. Um, I'll say it again at the end of the evening, but uh, just to kind of uh, sow the seed that this is a, uh, uh, an event that we're uh, inviting donations for. Um, our, uh, our, our room rental is the main funding stream for us at the, uh, at the community center. And obviously that's, uh, that's dried up a little bit. Um, uh, uh, so please do consider making a donation. Um, we'll put the uh, uh, address in again in the chat. Uh, you might, of course, uh, by the end of this evening's uh, discussion, you might decide that uh, putting your money in a uh, local community association is the most uh, sensible, sensible thing to do with it. So um, anyway, uh, I would like to uh, hand you over now to, uh, to, to Stephen Robinson. Um, and uh, to Nick Jackson. Uh, please put questions uh, in the chat uh, as we go along. Uh, then uh, at the end uh, of the, uh, the interview, uh, we'll kind of go into uh, what, what are called the lounge so we can carry on our, our conversation there. Um, thank you, Tim. Thanks very much indeed. Um, and I switched over to to me as it now. It's, it's, uh, um, um, can I just say, as, as, a, as a, I know some people are joining from locally and some people are joining from much further afield, but for those of us who are in Primrose Hill, um, we are all very grateful to people like Tim for keeping the flag flying due, due, uh, during these rather dreary, dispiriting months that we've all been through. Um, and if I might, in that spirit, give us a minor plug to um, the library, the women in the library who were there today when I popped by. They're, they're also insisting, maintaining a limited uh, presence of about six hours, I think, a week. Um, but it's um, they're doing a very good job. And uh, they're there, and there are lots of new books have come in. Uh, it was forced to close in March. So I do recommend people drop by there and um, make use of it because um, they're there to help and they're very enthusiastic. Um, very good um, to have um, Nicholas Shackson, who um, most people call Nick, um, who's produced a, a, a very interesting, very provocative book called The Finance Curse. Um, this is a copy of it here. Um, and um, it's, um, I, I, it really is a, two fingers up, but I suppose the conventional wisdom of the idea that the city of London is 
the one thing that keeps us going in the United Kingdom. Um, he argues uh, quite uh, strongly and powerfully that it's actually the opposite is one of the things that's holding us back. Um, he talks about a word which I was not familiar with, I have to say, which financialization of the economy, which effectively means that the productive sets of the economy are being leached by uh, groups, uh, he calls them FIRE, the, uh, as an acronym, which is finance, insurance, and real estate. I think we could also probably add, judging by what he writes out in the book, we could also add the accountancy firms um, and, and uh, possibly the legal profession as well, which, which do, of course, very, very well out of the very, very rich people um, who uh, liberalization of the city has brought to the capital. Um, Nick challenges the notion that resources are a boom. Um, and he, from his own experience working in oil rich Angola, although I think he would say oil unfortunate Angola, perhaps, um, he tracks from those early days when he was a journalist there how mineral wealth can make you poor and make your body politic unstable. Um, let me uh, throw it to Nick. Nick, can you describe this in more detail um, as you have in your book with uh, any other insights you get garnered since the book came out? Uh, yes, yeah, so I hope you can hear me because my screen has frozen, for which I apologise. Can you hear me okay? I, do, I can hear you. I, I hope everyone else can. Right. Um, I'm trying to sort this, but I don't know what's happened. Some for some, there's a ghostly picture of me um, on my screen, uh, but I don't think you can see my see me talking. But I ap apologies for that. I'll try and fix that. So, um, yeah, in general, the central argument of the of the finance curse is if you picture a fried egg with a yolk in the middle and the white on the outside, and the yolk is what you would call the useful parts of finance. We all need finance. We, we need a financial sector. We need it to you know, process our payments and, and ATM machines and lending to businesses and things like that. Um, but a financial sector, once it grows beyond that useful core, starts to become, and there's a lot of, there's an awful lot of kind of academic investigation of this. And um, I think a lot of people know this in the gut, but once you, once you get beyond this useful core, once it grows beyond this useful core, it starts to become more predatory. It starts to um, uh, engage in actions which are no longer aimed or involved in supporting the creation of wealth and, and prosperity and helping people and more at the what I call the extraction of wealth, um, taking wealth away from other sectors. And you mentioned the word financialization. Uh, and what that means is it means the penetration of financial techniques, financial institutions, um, financial methods of doing things into other parts of the economy, into all other parts of the economy, to pretty much all of them, to be fair, from aerospace to tourism to shoe manufacturing to uh, tech, you know, technology, everything has become financialized to a very significant degree. Um, and we can talk more about this financialization and what, what it means. Um, and, uh, but, but that's the essence of the, of the finance curse. Once your financial sector starts to grow too big, it starts to deliver harms. And there's one very important thing to say about this. So I think everybody understands that the financial sector using the tricks, they may be tax havens, they may be monopolization, they may be um, using limited liability laws in, in, in particular ways. Um, I think people understand that that can kind of redistribute wealth within the pie um, from you know, redistributed upwards in a sense from poorer sections of, of society to richer sections. I think that's I don't think many people would necessarily disagree with that. But what the finance curse is saying, it goes beyond that. And it's saying once your financial sector starts to grow too big and too much of this predatory stuff starts to dominate, it actually shrinks the pie. It makes your economy grow less, um, less well, and you actually lose, um, you know, you lose economic output. You become poorer overall as a country. So not only redistributing in the wrong way, increasing inequality, but also shrinking the pie. Um, and 
there is now a, a lot of um, that we can discuss in the, in the questions later. But there's a lot of research um, coming out from the International Monetary Fund, the Bank for International Settlements, and, and a, a range of others that essentially produce the same graph. It's a kind of up, upturned banana, a U, an upside down U shape. And what that graph shows is that when you start growing your financial sector from nothing, it supports growth. So, so the more finance grows, the more growth benefits and more, the more your economy benefits. But there comes a sort of optimal point at the top of this upside down U shape where you've kind of reached an optimal size for a financial sector where the, 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 the financial sector is doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's supporting the rest of the economy. It's providing useful services. But then you keep growing the financial sector and all this research is showing that as you keep growing this, the financial sector beyond this optimal point, um, it starts to harm growth. St growth starts to fall, and so this is the you know this is the shrinking of the pie that I was I, I was talking about, and that's really really the essence um, of the finance curse. Um, and there's one more analogy. I, it takes people a while to kind of um, often to, to to sort of get their heads around this idea because it is there is a paradox at the centre of it. You know, shrink finance for prosperity. It, it's it's, you know, uh, uh, people find it odd, to, you know, more, how can more money make you poorer? But that's kind of that's kind of what's going on here. Um, and, and, and the last analogy that I want to quick analogy is to make an analogy with it with, with tax havens just to help sort of frame this in a different way. Um, a tax haven. Um, I, I, I also wrote a book about tax havens um, some years ago, um, and I'm, uh, you know, a, a, a great critic of tax havens, but a tax haven effectively is a financial center that transmits harm outwards to other countries. The finance curse, by, cent by, by contrast, is a financial center again, but it transmits the harm inwards to your own country. And that's, so that's kind of um, what, that, that, that's the essence of it, really. You could say that your book is, um, was pressing in the sense that uh, you're in Germany, so you probably haven't walked um, through the city or Canary Wharf recently, but um, it seems to have come about the uh, collapsing of the financial uh, sector seems to have come about all at once uh, through COVID. Um, I know, I know it's perfectly possible that um, uh, it will bounce back, um, but it doesn't look very optimistic. And the people I know who work in the city are pretty depressed about the future. Will this? Will this? solve the problem? Has the city been cut down to size? I mean, notwithstanding the collateral damage, which presumably will be hideous for people who work around the city in the restaurants and so forth. But is this, is this a good thing that's happened? Um, I, I only caught the second half of your, of your question. I think what you're saying, um, because I had to refresh my browser to try and get my image working, I'm sorry it hasn't, still hasn't worked. Um, but were you saying that uh, COVID and Brexit will have damaged the city. Is that is that what you were saying? Well, I, I was saying that COVID COVID has sort of essentially shut the city and the Canary Wharf down, and it's still not reopened. I mean, that may well change, but there is likely to be, I, I would think, a, a, a very a quite substantial cut in the in the scale of, of the financial services sector as a result of COVID. Um, I, well, I think you know the problem with it, it's not as simple as that as that obviously um the city is you know as i said it's it's two things it's a useful part and it's a pro and it's a, a kind of predatory pro problematic part so when you have a big disruption like like brexit or like um covid you're going to disrupt both parts and where the balance of that is going to end up um is a very difficult and, com and, and complex question i do think that what's happening um, um we will see this process of what i call financialization um, uh, probably will advance as a result of COVID. I think that um, the best example I think is the, is the big tech sector. You know, companies like Zoom have done very well out of the. Uh, Apple has done uh, very well. Amazon has done you know made billions and billions of profits out of out of the COVID crisis, um, and they are entrenching their monopolistic position over areas of tech and and um, over many areas of our lives and this monopolization is an aspect of this financialization and I think um, this will push forwards these very harmful processes that we're seeing that are reflected in 
Um, you know, the size of the city of London is one measure of that. It's obviously a very crude measure because, again, you know, all these different things, processes going on in there. But I think um, in the past, pandemics have often resulted in more concentrated markets in um, things like this. And also they have disempowered a lot of people. They have put a lot of people out of work um, outside of the city who um, now will be in a more precarious position. And this is also a phenomenon that very significantly about power. It is a phenomenon about um, political power and um, uh, a relatively small number of people um, uh, being able to not dictate policy, but have a huge influence over policy. And I think COVID is probably going to reinforce this power dynamic, which will um, make it harder for those trying to tackle financialization and tackle these these processes that are going on, make, make it harder for them to, to, to succeed. So I think overall it's it's negative for many, many effect, many um, perspectives, obviously, but I think from this perspective, it's probably a net negative as well. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, Tim, is there a case for, is there something we can do about getting Nick, Nick back? Um, I was told to refresh my browser. I'm using Firefox. I mean, uh, I'm sorry about this, everyone. Um, I will try one more time. And then if not, I shall maybe switch to a different browser. Everybody's holding, everybody's holding. Okay. Right, my camera is now showing the correct blue light, but it's still not coming through. I don't know why. Um, Maybe the system is making a point about the lack of diversity of having three bald guys with glasses and probably every screen. Yes. Um, Does it make sense to have a little hiatus and for me to copy and paste this link into a different browser and duck out and duck back in again? Um, I yes, think. I think it probably does. Um, okay. Apologies for the disruption. I will be with you in a second. Uh, I suppose um, what I would say is that um, uh, assuming that um, Nick comes back, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more back and forth, and then we're going to um, invite questions, which um, can you type them, put them through the message system, and I will um put them to to nick I'm, I'm sure people will have probably much more penetrating questions than that i can offer at this stage um and um i'm i have to confess i'm i'm not an economist um so i uh, learned a lot reading this book um but i perhaps lack the penetration to come back with um trenchant uh, questions um so we hope i don't see any sign of nick coming back um, so maybe could you just speak to your experience of reading reading the book, Stephen? Well, yes. I mean, I think it's um, it, it's um, I think the book is, is is I think the book is very successful at laying down the um, the, the problem um, that we have. And I I I, I, had, I hadn't really thought of it like that. I'd always assumed I'd be one of those people who'd assume that the city, though I never worked in the city, was a sort of good thing, and um, that um, I mean. Not for me, but um, but it made a lot of money to the country, it paid for public services, um, and but I, I I'm I'm persuaded by Nick's argument that it, there are, there are consequences to this which are not necessarily beneficial, and I'm certainly it is definitely true that um, I mean this goes beyond just the British government, you know, this goes in America as well, but the lack of of scrutiny and lack of regulation of British financial institutions has been an absolute disgrace. And when you think that quite a lot of people in, in America went to prison after the banking crisis, and no one really has gone to prison uh, in Britain at all. I think they did They did try it before, to almost randomly selected the bankers from Barclays, didn't they? But um, it really is quite extraordinary how soft, um, I mean, people are in the financial sector have really not had their dollars felt uh, for quite grotesque um, uh, you know, dereliction of duty. And this extends also, it makes also good on, on the absolute destruction of the reputation 
of the big four accountancy firms, which have become essentially you know, management consultancies with chartered a few chartered accountants um, attached to them. Um, the the uh, regulation of that has been deplorable, and most a lot of as we see time and time and time again, the companies getting into trouble, airlines getting into trouble, but the actual annual uh, scrutiny of the of the something as humdrum as the company accounts it seems that accountancy firms just don't really want to do that anymore. The money is in in, in the consultancy, and so there's a grotesque conflict of interest often that one of the big four will be auditing the public the listed company while at the same time earning vast amounts of money in consultancy fees so it's not exactly surprising that the benefit of the doubt goes to the company uh, rather than to the uh, shareholders who like to be out of pocket um nick you're back nick is back can you see me yes thank you hi everyone i'm sorry about that i was um, sort of dancing around the Things of your book probably yeah. getting them. Thanks. Thanks for, um, for covering. Thanks for filling, Stephen. I was, um, <laughs> I, we, I, we were talking about accountancy, but I, actually, I'm very interested in um, one of the things. One of the things you talk about about Luxembourg, I think, is 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 right at the nexus of this, isn't it? And to me, reading that, I mean, one always knew that Luxembourg was a shockingly regulated um, tax haven. But I think it begs to me a question: Why was it tolerated? By by the European Union, particularly. I, 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 that's the, for me. That's the, the the really big question. That is a very good. That is a very good question. And in you know in the finance course, I'm I'm pretty critical of of, of the Europe, European Union. I, I I'm not in the book. I don't take a position on Brexit um, uh, because I think that there is too much. Um, you know, I think the European Union is is a force for good in many areas, um, but it has many, many uh, very, very serious problems. Um, and Luxembourg, is a, it's, it is a tax haven. W what is a tax haven? There are, there's no real definition out there of what a tax haven is. Lots of different ones, um, many technical ones. My, uh, I boil the definition of a tax haven down to two words, really. Um, the words are escape and elsewhere. So you take your money elsewhere, offshore, to escape the rules you don't like. And those rules might be tax, um, but there might be other things. There might be disclosure, secrecy. You might be a criminal trying to hide stuff. Um, they might be financial regulation. This is my very broad definition. Um, I see offshore as a sort of place where you um, you try and attract. There's this whole sort of ocean of capital, of, of financial capital sloshing around the world, and you're trying to attract that capital as a tax haven, um, if that's your sort of national strategy. And you're trying to attract it with enticements. You're trying to attract it with... Um, uh, low taxes or loophole tax loopholes or, or financial secrecy or very lax financial regulation or very um, uh, particular corporate corporate governance rules. Delaware is, is a sort of tiny little tax haven inside the United States where that's one of the great att attractions. One, you know, most or many of the world's biggest companies, Coca-Cola and many others are, are incorporated in a in a rather seedy looking business um, building in Orange Street in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, and that's because they and they pay just a few hundred you know, just small, small fees to register there. And then they get the benefit of Delaware's courts, which are very friendly towards um, uh, management. And, and so there's this kind of game going on with lots of different jurisdictions offering lots of different things in different niches. Um, and so some niches are very specialized so you might get a, a you know the cook islands is a very small tiny little niche and it it offers very very sort of impregnable and very kind of sleazy trusts um so that would be a very specific niche somewhere like luxembourg offers a lot more than that it offers it has offered um a lot of tax um facilities so there was a great lux leak scandal when there was a, a, a series of um leaks whistleblower leaks from uh, PwC that was operating in basically operating a kind of tax avoidance factory in Luxembourg for many of the world's biggest multinationals, um, you know, many Nike and lots and lots of ExxonMobil, lots and lots of household names. Um, and these companies were able to go to Luxembourg and um, say to PwC, please cook us up a, a, a tax strategy. And this would be a sort of international tax strategy that would involve several stepping stones involving Luxembourg, but other places, 
um, uh, depending on what they were trying to do. And they would get these really complicated tax strategies and there were often sort of diagrams, complicated diagrams of where the money would flow and and they would take it to um, a guy called, uh, he, I can't remember his name, but he was known as Monsieur Ruling. And he would make a ruling and he'd basically say, yes, this is fine and put a sort of rubber stamp on it. And then that was all legal. Um, and so Luxembourg was doing this kind of stuff. It was also um, very involved in quite complicated structures enabling people with money to hide that money, hide it from the tax man or from criminal authorities or whatever. Um, there has been a bit of cleanup recently, um, but why has the European Union tolerated this? Um, it's, it, it's a very good question. And Luxembourg is one of the founder members of the original, original group. And it has always been very influential um, in, in the European Union. And there, is, there are lots of areas where there is um, kind of, you have to have unanimous voting for things to, to be changed. Um, so that is that is a problem. If you want to change things, sometimes um, in certain areas you can't. If one or two, and you'll always get the same. You know, Ireland, Luxembourg, and a few others say no, we, we don't accept this. Um, and there is also another thing: um, the the single market rules um, make it quite hard for you to put obstacles in the way. If you start trying to block things, um, you start you can sometimes get in the way. You get fall foul of the single market rules. So there's a, a whole series of things um, that prevents the European Union from doing much about Luxembourg. Um, mm. Having said that, you know, uh, I think, you know, London, the UK, it plays some similar games, some different games, some of the same games it plays, like on sequence stuff, it kind of farms out to the British overseas territories and crown dependencies, the Cayman Islands, Jersey, Guernsey, and British Virgin Islands, places like that, um, in a sort of complicated, um, to use a slightly sinister analogy, the spider's web. Um, where kind of capital is handled in these places and often the, 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 the real business of doing the kind of, um, you know, the nuts and bolts of putting together that merger or putting together that tax strategy or whether will, will be handled in London. So kind of, um, you know, fees and, and wealth flow to London. So, um, but but yeah, Luxembourg is a, is a very interesting, the Financial Times um, Alphaville had a, um, had a piece of, I think it was in 2017 calling Luxembourg essentially a, a criminal enterprise with a state attached or something like that um, and I think that's not so far from the truth I mean it's it's one of these kind of you know you go there and it's squeaky clean everyone's incredibly polite it's very like Switzerland in that respect and um, I, it was one of the in my previous book Treasure, Treasure Islands um, it was often my first question when I was interviewing people um, in Switzerland and other places so you, you say just you know the Swiss have a reputation for like the Luxembourgs for being honest, um, clean, uh, spotless, tidy, all these really good qualities, um, polite um, and trustworthy. And that the trustworthy thing is absolutely crucial. Um, and yet at the same time, Switzerland has been, so, so because of those qualities, it sort of ended up very high up on these, you know, you have Transparency International Corruptions Perceptions Index you know, which are the most corrupt countries in the world and, you know, all the African countries rise to the top and, you know, Switzerland, one of the cleanest and Luxembourg as well and the UK too. Um, but at the same time, Switzerland has historically and still is to a significant degree, one of the world's biggest kind of turntables for dirty money, for, for money looted out of Africa, for uh, organized crime, criminal money. Um, I mean, they, it, there's less than there used to be in Switzerland um, and in Luxembourg. Um, but still, it. How do you square these? There's an apparent contradiction here. You know, there's sort of extreme trustworthiness and and um, honesty and tidiness and and against this other aspect of huge turntable for sort of dirty money, sort of global epicenter of corruption, if you will. Um, and it, it became clear to me that it's it's a business model which is sort of industrial policy, you might call it, for a country, where you say to the world's capital, you can trust us not to steal your money. Send your money to us, we'll handle it, we won't steal your money. But we will also turn a blind eye if you want to steal someone else's money. If you want to do something dirty that damages someone else, somewhere else, that's fine. Trust us, but also trust us not to, not to cause trouble for you. And so it's a very, it's a very strange kind of, um, uh, formula but it's been very effective for those um people in those countries who who got very rich out of it 
Um, and I think the UK plays that game to a very significant degree as yeah. well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, um, we have. We have. Let me turn to Doro. I'm interested in the way we are made to think of competition in inverted commas between countries. Thre threats from big companies to leave. How can this be challenged? Yeah, that's a very good question. And that's a question that um, I come across all the time. Um, and it, it's tied up with this thing they call competitiveness. Um, you know, we've got to be competitive. You, you, you hear it um, sometimes, politicians say, we've got to have a competitive tax system. We've got to have a competitive financial regulation. We can't tax them or regulate them too much, or they're going to run away to Hong Kong or Singapore um, or Geneva or Zurich or wherever. Um, and this is uh, a very, very effective tool, this threat. It is a threat. It's like, don't do this, don't tax us, or we're going to run away, and then you'll lose jobs. And that's and, and it's, a, it's a threat that has been very effective, and politicians kind of n uh, not knowing what to do in the face of this threat say, okay, we'll give you what you want. It's, um, it's uh, you know, you, you could call it blackmail, I suppose. And it, it happens all the time. Um, you know, in, in Britain, it usually happens in very, very sophisticated ways. You know, you'll have... Um, HSBC, you know, whispering in the ears of FT journalists saying, um, we're considering our options about um, where we're going to locate our headquarters and um, we're doing long term reviews and not saying anything explicit. We're you know, not making explicit threats, but just kind of these very kind of subtle messages that are put out and um, certainly within government, but also put out into the media. And, you know, what can you do in the face of these threats? Well, two things. One, historically these threats are made all the time and talk is cheap and historically time and again when governments have called the bluff of these big companies you know they say it in the oil industry as well you know don't make our fiscal regime any more onerous or we'll we'll run away um and historically very often countries have said um you know opec countries for example said i'm sorry we're not going to play that game anymore and we're going to we're going to um massively increase our revenues and increase your tax take after these threats have been made and then the the companies are faced with you know are they going to take um are they going to run away you know their their profits are going to be cut in half but they're still got making massive profits um are they going to run away from half the profits that they used to have and nearly always they don't they um you know the bluff is called and they don't they don't run away and it turns out that the high tax countries um have in the long term grown roughly as fast as the low tax countries but with less inequality in general terms so you could argue that the high tax countries have, have generally been better off um and and there's a whole sort of historical story to tell there but the other the other side of it is that the the finance curse way of looking at things is actually very liberating from this perspective because it's saying um you know let's say take financial regulation for example um financial companies you know before the global financial crisis and, and to a certain degree um since have have made these threats you know you can't regulate us too much you mustn't put this regulation in place we're all going to flee and um the finance curse argument says well this lacks regulation that has caused the crisis and has also continued to cause other many many other problems that i outline in the book um is actually net regulation that we need to protect our own country so if we deregulate and we allow these predatory activities to become more dominant then we're hurting ourselves and so if we regulate properly and effectively in the name of our country and our people and what they need um the the company certainly will threaten to leave and maybe they will leave they will take part of their operations away. They will still have profits to be made here. They will keep some of their operations here. And in general, it's quite a good sorting machine because um, good, strong regulation will tend to keep the stuff that you want and it will tend to chase the predatory stuff away, which is exactly what you want. So you can kind of turn away from this competitiveness meme that you hear all the time. I mean, other terms are not open for business. We must be open for business, which, you know, it sounds great and we should be open for business and welcoming to business. But the question is, what kind of business? And you need to have effective regulation. You need to have an effective tax system that allows you to um, 
that allows you to, um, you know, educate your people and build roads and infrastructure and, um, you know, have a decent health system. That's what companies want. That's what the investors really want. That's what, you know, if you want, you know, the best kind of investment is probably, a, you know, I don't know, a car factory or something. Um, you know, they need good roads. They need healthy and educated workforce. All of this stuff takes tax and you need to you need to have, a, you know, a strong tax system that, that can provides these things. Okay, well, um, Nick, the question, um, thanks for that, a question uh, which is um, from a, a, a robust business perspective. Uh, Andrew Davidson, um, he says, surely there are more macroeconomics that come into play regarding the tipping point for a country. For example, Ireland, uh, you talk about Ireland quite a lot in the book, of course, um, and, and it's what recent financial history, not, not very flattering, but, um, Andrew says, uh, for example, Ireland has done a fantastic job for their country attracting large companies, especially pharma, by offering them such as things such as 12% corporation tax rate. They are a tiny island that thrive by investing in business as a tax haven. I do have an opposite bias as I have companies in Delaware, etc., and have seen a lot of benefit from this. What, what would you say to that? Right, yes, Ireland. I've got a whole chapter on Ireland in um, the Finance Coast book, and there is a completely different story to be told. There is, a, there is this, Ireland is a kind of totemic example. You know, they had this Celtic tiger and had this 12 and a half corporate tax rate. And people have, in Ireland and beyond, have always said, look at Ireland, it cut its corporate tax rates 12 and a half percent. And they got this fantastic economic boom. That's not what happened. Ireland started trying to be a tax haven in 1956 um, with a thing called the Export Profit Relief Tax. Um, and it introduced um, several other kind of attempts at being a tax haven to sort of cut tax rates or provide, you know, loopholes or whatever for companies to come. Now, how do you measure the result of that? Well, you could measure, you know, Ireland grew economically since 1956. But a, a, a proper measure that tells you whether this is actually making a difference is um, a comparison of Ireland's GNI per capita um, GNI is a is a version of gross domestic product GDP, which strips out profit shifting. So, if you use GDP, you know a lot of profit shifting comes through Ireland. This is multinationals shoveling huge profits, but it hardly touches the sides, and it doesn't really get into the Irish economy, and it doesn't benefit Irish people. So, GNI per capita is a better measure. It's not perfect, but it's a better measure. Gives you a sense of how well Ireland is doing. Irish people are doing. Um, so the best measure of what's happened since 1956, since Ireland started trying to be a, a, a tax haven, is um, GNI, GNI per capita as a share of the European average. So compared to other European country, countries, how well has Ireland been doing? And if you actually go and find the data and you plot it on a graph, you get this remarkable picture. And I'm thinking, am I, I think this is going the right way. I don't know if this isn't a mirror image. Okay. So on this graph, you start in 1956 and Ireland's GNI per capita is roughly two thirds of the European average, um, something like that, maybe 60%, I can't remember. And it flatlines, it flatlines, 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 all the way till 1992, 93. And then it goes like this. It, it suddenly jumps into the stratosphere and that's the Celtic tiger. And it, it, it actually, you have a boom and then you have a crash and then you have another boom. And, and now Ireland's um, GNI per capita is significantly higher than the European average. So this is very different from the story of the tax haven causing Ireland's growth. What actually happened was um, there were a series of things that came, came together. I mean, in the book I describe it as the luck of the Irish. There was a series of educational reforms that suddenly produced a huge rush of um, uh, well-educated graduates onto the market just just around that time and, and a, a huge surge of women into the workforce and all, all sorts of things like that. But the really big thing that 1992-93 suddenly created the thing was Ireland entered the single market. And here you had a country that was um, for American multinationals, uh, friendly, a lot of American bosses had, you know, links to the old country, English speaking, and in the single market, suddenly you had access to this whole European market, this sort of seamless market where they could set up shop in Ireland and sell their services. Often they were kind of digital services and sell it to, you know, someone in France or Germany or, or wherever. And that's what really caused that takeoff. It's a very different story. Now, of course, the corporate tax incentives will have changed the shape of that thing. But uh, 
did did they did they help the Irish people overall? I argue not in the book. I argue that it made a much more boom and bust cycle. Um, and also by virtue of having much lower tax rates, they would have got much lower tax revenues than they would have done otherwise. Um, I mean, you can't really be sure how much investment. It would have been a different investment shape and different um, US investment coming in. But basically that whole story about Ireland's 12.5% corporate tax rate caused the Celtic Tiger is wrong. It's a myth. And um, if you want to read more about it, then I know a book where you can read it or find out. Yes. I mean, I, I, I can't really say that. Sorry, Stephen, yeah. I, could I just, thank you, yeah. could I just, just mention, uh, we've got some, the, we seem to have sort of two chat boxes, it seems, on this. So there's one called yes, chat, sir. and then there's one underneath it, there's one called questions. Yes, I just got, I've just got into questions now. Yeah. So. Thank you so yeah. much. Okay. Thank Wonderful. you. Um, Bye. Okay. Um, um, sorry, let me just, uh, I had the question there. Yes, um, uh, Carolyn Heyman asks, um, did this all start with, well, you partially answered this, did this all, I think this should not talk about Ireland here, I think generally, did this all start with the Big Bang in 1986? And then se se secondly, any idea how it can be unwound? Okay, um, no, this didn't start with the Big Bang in 1986. So there's a, the historical story, in fact, through history, you know, going back centuries, there have been conflicts between finance and other parts of the economy, manufacturing and so on. Um, I, I think probably goes, go into that um, a bit later because it's a bit of a distraction from the main point, but the, the historical story I want to tell is after the Second World War, you had had not only the war, but you'd had the Great Depression beforehand, which was a Great Depression very much born out of finance. I mean, significantly in the United States, but it reverberated around the world. Um, you had a massive kind of financial dominance of uh, markets, which created this enormous crash, devastating crash. Um, and so that provided the kind of, that sort of discredited finance. And then the Second World War provided the sort of political impetus to really do something. And there was, Lord Carrington describes how he um, how he used to um, whatever it sleep under his tank in the war um, with his working class comrades and like they were like the best people he'd ever known and and you know when we get into power we're going to do something for these people and I think there was and also people who had you know lost family members and and shed their blood in the war really didn't want to take any more kind of of this um, domination. They really wanted something different. So there was a massive change in political will, like what is politically possible? And they created this remarkable international architecture called the Bretton Woods system, which was uh, a way of recognizing that finance was dangerous. You know, it was useful, but potentially dangerous and putting finance back very carefully into its box. So from an international perspective, what they did in the Bretton Woods system from the Second World War was to very carefully regulate flows of finance across borders. You, you could, if you were trading, if you were selling a goods across borders, you could then arrange, you could get permission. You go to the central bank and you get permission, like I need to transfer this much money overseas and you get a stamp um, saying, yes, you can do this. But generally speculation across borders, all the stuff you see these days was stopped. I mean, it was leaky, of course, and tax havens started coming in and um, sort of punching holes in the system. But for about a quarter of a century after the, 20, after the Second World War, you had this, um, it's called financial repression, when the financial sector was really, really crushed, and people in the city were absolutely furious. Um, and um, this is people in the city who really had grown rich. You know, this, this dates from the British Empire, when London was the kind of, the sort of uh, the, the 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 governor of the imperial engine as they call it the sort of s central turntable in which all the imperial kind of money went through and the city was used to being very dominant in british society and suddenly they were crushed down and they were absolutely furious and looking for escape routes um and uh, that period by the way which was also a period of very very high taxes um in the u.s top income tax rates went above 90 percent um in the uk effective top income tax rates went up as high as 98 percent um and there was much stronger antitrust anti-monopoly regulation it was very hard much harder for big companies to grow big lots of very what you would call very progressive things that period that quarter century is now 
called the golden age of capitalism. It was um, the period of highest economic growth um, in world history before or since. Um, and what happened after that is you had finance started coming out of its box. And there was a thing called the euro dollar market, which was really the precursor of the Big Bang, which was a sort of, um, it was very involved in tax havens and London was the center of it. It was a kind of an escape route from this Bretton Woods, Woods, Woods system. The Bank of England said, let's allow this stuff to happen in London. It grew like a balloon and eventually began to dominate global markets and money just started sloshing around the world. And it's sort of by the mid 70s, that Bretton Woods system of financial repression was, was killed, was dead. And um, finances started to go much more quickly around the world. Um, and economic growth started to fall, inequality started to rise, and you got a lot more financial crisis sin since then. So, and, and the Big Bang was just another very important and more famous step in this process of financial liberal liberalization that happened. Um, and the city of London was right at the center of the liberalization of, of global markets. Um, but it was kind of the second step after the Second World War, um, after the Euro dollar markets. And um, so now, well, yeah. Nick, I want to ask you, that to me, there's a, there's a, there's a peculiar, um, slightly baffling omission in your book, if I may say so. And I, I read it closely and I checked the index to make sure I haven't missed it. But you were writing this during the leadership, Labour leadership of Jeremy Corbyn, um, at a time when populists were going great gangbusters across the Atlantic in the early skirmishes of the uh, presiden uh, presidential election. But there's not a single mention of Jeremy Corbyn. There's not a mention of John McDonnell. Um, you don't you're obviously firmly politically firmly on the left but you yet you seem you you seem to be by omission at least uh resigned to the fact that formal parliamentary uh democracy is not going to remove the finance curse and that you seem to be hinting in your conclusion at sort of extra parliamentary activity through the fair tax allies or whatever um it's called. is that is that is that fair? Is that correct? Yeah, it is. It is a glaring omission. I, I agree with you. And I thought long and hard about whether to include Corbyn in and um, what to say about him, because um, I, I was quite ambivalent about about Corbyn. I, I think um, I, I did like a lot of the things that he was saying. I mean, he recognized that that um, and, and John McDonnell recognized many of the problems that I had been describing and accepted that they needed to be tackled. But there were all sorts of other things going on that were very um, that were very uh, maybe alienating or, or, or difficult, and, and in, in some senses I, I felt a little old-fashioned. Um, but I, I, I was, you know, I, I definitely would have voted for him. I didn't because I lived outside of the UK for too long, and I, I don't have my vote anymore. Um, but uh, I didn't mention him in the book. I mean. It, you know, I could have, but I would have, I would have got caught up in all sorts of things which I felt were a distraction, and I wanted to focus on because once you say the word Corbyn, uh, particularly in those times, you're pressing a button, and your all sorts of assumptions and and love or hate will emerge in the reader's eyes, and I, I think it's very important to cut through that stuff, that um, that complicated stuff. And and by the way, I mean, you said that I'm, you know, you, I'm on the left. I I don't disagree with that, but also I don't like that um, because I think so many of these issues that I'm talking about, and I'm sure you'd agree with me having read the book, um, are not really issues that belong to the left or to the right. I think, you know, this is about the corruption of markets. Um, this is about crime. This is about corruption. This is about um, uh, people being able to take rewards without taking risks. Um, it, it's about things that this is not what, you know, even if you're a staunch believer in capitalism, this is not what capitalism is supposed to be. This is a, this is, this is rigged. This is, there's something wrong going on here. And I think Corbyn very much recognized that. Um, but I, I don't think, you know, it's left, it, people on the left who, who worry about rigged markets or about corruption. I think plenty of people on the right, you know, whatever those terms mean these days. Mm. So I don't really, you know, I, this is not a book for people on the left. It, I, I get, it's probably written in more kind of left friendly language, I would say. Um, I, you know, I do get a bit hot under the collar when I'm thinking about these things sometimes. And maybe that was reflected. I, I think in, on reflection, maybe 
I was a you little. Call, bit... You call Hayek a mediocre Austrian economist. Yeah, that, yeah. that was a, that was an indication. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. By that token, Napoleon's a sort of mid-ranking, uh, you know, course good military strategist, I think. <laughs> uh, but, um, um, but, <laughs> but I mean, the moment I, when I can't help thinking, I, I felt as I finished your book, I felt the moment sort of in a way is no danger. The moment's past. We have now. We now have a Labour Party led by a man who's actually our, our local MP here, uh, who's actually popular in these parts, Keir Starmer. But I mean, he's not going to lead us to lead us to a new Jerusalem, a slimmed down uh, city of London, is he? No, I don't see that. I mean, it, you know, I think it's probably early days. I think he's probably still deciding about these things, but I haven't seen any very clear signs of of a real willingness to properly take on this because if you're taking on the city you know to take on this agenda you are taking on the city of london which is arguably the most powerful interest of all um in the uk economy um, not in germany where i live um that's probably cars but uh i don't see the same willingness you know i think corbyn was willing to actually confront this thing um in in slightly odd ways sometimes but but he he you know he saw the problem um, he saw some aspects of financialization. I don't think he necessarily saw it all, but um, uh, I don't see quite the same willingness with Keir Starmer. I think uh, this government is entirely on the wrong side of this um, of this debate. Boris Johnson. I actually have. Um, I don't. I, I was going to share my screen and show you something, um, which I think illustrates something about the finance curse. But I, given the technical problems, I should probably avoid it. It was. Yeah. A, it was a, a, a short video of Boris Johnson saying some years ago when he was mayor of London saying you will create jobs in Strathclyde um, more if you invest in Croydon in London than if you invest directly in Strathclyde. You know, this image of London as the kind of engine of the British economy from which wealth and jobs and stuff, you know, the, the, the dominant view in Britain that London is the kind of wealth creating engine and um, taking a geographical perspective. Um, I, you know, in the book, I look at a lot of these structures where the extraction is happening out in the provinces, out in the regions, out in Scotland, in you know, also poorer parts of London, and the wealth is being realised, is being being funnelled into, um, a, you know, relatively small number of people. Um, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of them probably, um, including all the lawyers and accountants and so on, but um, a relatively small section of the population is the beneficiary, clustered mostly around London, and so. You know, the image of all this wealth flowing outwards from London, in fact, there's all sorts of flows coming in exactly the operation, the opposite direction under the table. And the Finance Curse book argues those flows are much bigger than the visible flows you see going out. Right. So it's a net. Um, so rebalancing, you know, we're always talking about rebalancing the UK economy. And the big question is, can you rebalance the economy without reducing the city of London, without shrinking the city of London? And I would answer no. I think you have to. Um, you can't just uplift the regions. You have to shrink the predatory stuff in the city if you want the, the regions to prosper. Right. Here's here's a here's a timely question. Um, uh, given uh, recent events over the last few weeks, uh, from Dali, Dali P, uh, does your reference to the British Empire not suggest that the UK has particular cultural issues with regard to finance and the associated city professions, an attitude of entitlement? that undermines other parts of the country. Okay, um, I think the attitude of entitlement is very important. Uh, I, just a little anecdote. I know a guy called David Marchant who runs a company called Offshore Alert. They're based in Miami and they kind of like an, a tax haven. They, they investigate tax haven shenanigans and stuff like that. And he said um, when he sees in a financial structure that he's investigating, if he sees a lord or a sir or one of these British titles, he takes it as a red flag. Um, and what that tells me is that the, the British establishment has become so thoroughly steeped in these processes. And um, my belief is that a sense of entitlement that has been instilled and inculcated in a lot of people since they were at school or, or, or whenever um, means that people are prepared to do anything to get to the position they, they, they feel they need to be in. And, um, and that doing anything really has corrupted the, the large parts of the British establishment um, where they are prepared to get involved in activities that 
um, you know, these things that are going on out in tax havens um, really are, a lot of them are very, very unsavory, and, but in order to maintain their place in society. Um, cultural issues with regard to finance, I mean, that is something that needs an awful lot of unpacking. There is a whole, I mean, in my previous book, um, I've got a title uh, called The Second British Empire, which looks at how, again, in 1956, the Suez Crisis, um, when that was the kind of trigger for Britain to, to sort of step away from all its colonies, pull its forces out, and, and you know, you had a series of countries going independent after that and a little bit before that, um, but Suez was kind of the watershed. And that was also the time when the euro dollar market I was talking about, which made sort of London regain its status as the world financial center, kind of started. And so I think I, I think you can start talking, you know, there are other people who talk about, you know, empire 2.0. So Britain kind of stepped away from having soldiers and and governors in all of these places, um, or most of these places, and now it's doing it through finance. It's got financial, um, uh, whatever you want to call them, tentacles, if that's not a bit sinister, um, in countries all, all over the world, you know, a lot of money coming into the city of London. Um, and a lot of these things, I was just looking at a deal in Ghana um, last week, very, very um, unsavory deal that they're talking about that was rushed through parliament with, with almost no scrutiny. Um, and a lot of city players involved in that. So there's, there is, you know, there's a whole story to be told here. Um, and I, I don't think we can get into the sort of detailed cultural aspects of it, but it's a good question. Stephen, hi, Nick. Thank hi. You. Yeah, just, uh, I'm just noticing, noticing yeah. the clock is, the clock is, uh, has, has brought us all the way around uh, to the, pretty much to the end of the hour. But I think maybe we've got time for one more question. Um, then once that's finished, uh, I'm going to press a button that was is going to take us all, everyone here, into uh, what on Airmeet is called the lounge, um, and uh, you will be able to pick yourselves a table uh, and uh, have a conversation with whoever else you find on that table, um, part of our community connection service. Um, so you may find Nick and Stephen there as well. Uh, you may end up on a different table. Um, but uh, I just wanted to read actually the last, the last, the last lines of the book. Uh, so uh, it speaks a little bit to what uh, Nick was talking about in terms of politics, but the old political divisions between left and right are dead. In today's Britain, one of the greatest political divisions is between those who support financialization and the finance curse and those who want to return finance to its proper place, serving society. Which side are you on? So, uh, thanks, guys. I think uh, one more question I think from you, Stephen. I think, we'll I think that's a good, a good note to to end on. Right. Okay, um, fine. Um, then. So, thanks very much, indeed, Nick. For um, thank you, Stephen. Thanks for been very interesting talking to you. Great to talk to you. So.